Um, we've got a tremendously experienced lineup here today, and I'm really delighted to be introducing the panelists to you. Uh, and it's really exciting and interesting to hear what they think about the markets and um, what are the uh, ingredients for success um, for LCCs um, at, you know, growing in, 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 the, in this region. Um, what I'm going to do, I'll take little breaks throughout this session to invite members of the audience to ask questions. So if you want to join in and ask a question, just raise your hand and hopefully Fu will be able to see you because I can't see you too well because of the lights here. But if you want to ask a question, um, stick your hand up and then we'll, uh, we'd like to invite participation from the audience. Um, we've seen, as we saw, a huge surge in LCC capacity share across all of our markets. Investors are showing a lot of faith in these operators. Indigo of India raised $450 million uh, last year in a successful IPO. Spring raised uh, $290 million um, in an IPO early last year. AirAsia is raising a billion dollars through um, a debit a credit note um, later this year. So investors have a lot of faith in these models. I've looked at the order books for our four panelists. And in fact, uh, you, you have an average of over 40% increase in capacity um, looking at your orders versus your current fleets. And what I really want to ask e each of you is, do you think there are too many LCCs with too many aircraft now? And I'm just going to ask this question of each of you in turn and see what, see what, you, what, what you think. So maybe we start with Jim. Well, um, the first thing, when I saw your profitability map, I was very happy that I was located in North Asia and I don't have to deal with the <laughs> South Asia profitability. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think LCC is a really bad term to describe uh, airline models. And maybe it's more traditional players and new entrants, because even when I see LCCs, um, especially in North Asia, yeah. there's nothing in common between the business models. So you have LCCs in North Asia, um, their standard turnaround times are an hour, um, they have multi-fleet planes, uh, the vast majority of their sales go through travel agents, they do very little brand marketing, um, they just don't look like when I think of uh, our business model or other traditional you know, business models like uh, Southwest Airlines, Ryanair. So I, I think it's, a, first of all, a misnomer to put everybody into a bucket and call them LCCs. Yeah. So maybe it's more of a spectrum of airlines. They have different models. Um, so maybe the question is, is there too much airline capacity or, you know, uh, in the market? And there, I think North Asia is still growing, so we don't have that issue yet, and you can tell by the penetration rates. Mm. Uh, certainly in South Asia, it's a, it's a different uh, challenge. Uh, but what I do think is that there are probably too many airlines that have bad business models. Uh, they don't really know what they want to be, and over time, they're going to struggle. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Albert, Indonesia. Indonesia. Um, Indonesia have, um, I think, uh, three big uh, uh, LCC group. So for a country that uh, with 250 million population and six hours from west to east, I think three big groups of LCC um, uh, is still okay. Um, but, but the problem is that is the, um, the number of aircraft that has been put into, uh, into the Indonesia is making a problem. So um, uh, I think uh, it is not in terms of number of LCCs, uh, but then uh, uh, in terms of number of aircraft that has been there uh, for quite some time. And, and also, uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, the delivery order is still very big. And then uh, for CityLink itself, uh, we have now 36 aircraft, but 44 aircraft on order that have mm. to be delivered. So um, more than 100% additional capacity. I think uh, um, in Southeast Asia as a whole, there are 23 LCCs for 10 countries. I think uh, uh, two per country is, in terms of number, is okay, but in terms of capacity, I think it's a little problem. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. Uh, uh, for, I think, 
few decades ago, uh, the, trans the air aviation transportation, aviation is just like uh, high-end transportation uh, in the market. Because, like, I remember when I was young, the uh, when when the Chinese uh, passengers when when they want when they want to buy a ticket, they have to get some kind of certificate. And uh, but today, the uh, aviation come into ordinary come into the ordinary life. So it's uh, I think just like a uh, taxi business. It's, uh, I think it's never complained that uh, there are too many taxi. But uh, for, 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 Chinese, uh, for, 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 the, for the Chinese market today, there's a, we, have, uh, we only have about three, four low-cost carriers. And the, the market demands for aviation is about uh, uh, at least 15-20 percent, you know, growth rate. And the, uh, for, for, the, for, for the industry, the the, the capacity only only grows by 10 to 12 percent. So I think for the uh, China, for the China market, the, it's 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 not uh, it's it's far below the over far below the it's it, I mean it's too early to say the, uh, over capacity. Yeah, yeah. So demand is still far outstripping supply in case of, of China and, and maybe for North Asia as well. Campbell, you're 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 in the thick of it down down in Southeast Asia. What, what's your your experience been? Uh, Yes and no, we're not necessarily in the thicket. If you look at the uh, domestic penetration of LCC, Singapore is zero. Oh, so there's uh, quite a difference between us and the rest of the markets. Mm. Um, I, I'd echo uh, Jim's point that uh, you know, what is called an LCC isn't necessarily accurate. If you look at the, the Scoot product, for example, uh, there's two classes of travel. There is in-flight Wi-Fi, there is uh, you know, premium cabin. Uh, there, there are attributes on that aircraft that are normally associated with a full service carrier, yes, yet our unit cost is a little over two US cents per kilometer. Um, so do we feel there's too many LCCs? Well, no, and I say that for two reasons. One, our business model is flying medium haul, uh, four to nine hours at the moment. Uh, that takes us beyond the range of the low cost uh, short haul carriers. So we're competing in a, a thinner market, but a, a, a a market that we can tend to dominate. Um, and when you ask whether there are too many LCCs in whose opinion, uh, in the customer's opinion, I think there's more than enough. And the fact that you know, we see such dramatic rates of growth and such dramatic rates of penetration in this part of the world indicates that from their perspective, there's, there's not too many. Mm. From the full service carrier's perspective, when you look at your profitability map, all of the full service carriers in Southeast Asia would say there's far too many. Uh, from the LCC's perspective, most of us are, are, are being well funded, most of us are being well supported, most of us are declaring uh, at least some sort of respectable profitability at the moment. Um, so I think from our LCC's perspective, there's not too many. Mm, mm. Uh, I, I think you know, the, the China model is, is still uh, driving the region. Those of us that have exposure to China are able to take advantage of market growth in excess of our capacity growth. And uh, I think it will continue for a, at least a while yet. Mm. It's very interesting. And I guess also, I mean, in any market, there are winners and losers. So, um, and of course, in Europe, for example, I think over 90% of the original startup airlines, when you had single European skies, I think over 90% of those airlines failed. And then you had the emergence of the two sort of mega carriers with Ryan and Easy. So um, I guess it's different horses for different courses. And I think what you were saying, Jim, absolutely right. They're not really LCCs. There's a sort of a spectrum of of different carriers, as, as you were saying, Campbell, offering very different products. Um, so um, that's very interesting. Um, infrastructure. I was in Bangkok last week, and I met with um, one of our member airlines, and they were telling me that a 320 captain pilot today costs the same as a 380 pilot last year. So basically, what you were paying a, a, a pilot to fly an Airbus A380 last year you now have to pay to a pilot flying an A320. So there are huge problems with infrastructure in terms of qualified personnel. Um, you've also got all sorts of issues across our region in terms of airports, slots, availability. And I'd really like to ask um, Spring and CityLink for their insights on maybe the China market and the Indonesia market. Um, what do you see as the sort of major issues in terms of infrastructure? And how do things look different? So maybe, Stephen, if I could ask you first. Well, <clears throat> the uh, infrastructure uh, uh, is also a big issue for the uh, for Chinese aviation industry, because uh, today almost uh, all the 
all the major airports there uh, uh, almost reached reach that capacity already. So uh, the uh, CAC is planning to build up more air, more airports in the next in, in the next five years, and we also look forward to the, uh, the you know, either Shanghai, Beijing, Shanghai, Beijing, and also the other major cities also have to, have the plan to for the for the new aircraft for the for the new air for mm -hmm. the new airport by the 20, around the 2020. And for the pilot issue is because, as I, as I said, uh, the, just 10 years ago, the whole, in, the whole industry only have 60, uh, 600 aircraft. But today, we have 20, uh, 26, 2,600 aircraft today. Wow. So uh, the, uh, the pilot, is, uh, is, there's, a, there's a huge gap mm. for the pilot. And uh, uh, for, for spring, we, when we first entered, when we first entered into the industry, we start to, Send our uh, send our staff, send our students to to the uh, to, to to the U.S. to learn how to drive it, and uh, uh, we we forecast in the next uh, probably two two three years we, we there will be a, there will be a lot of uh, uh, qualified pilots you know not only for n not only for spring but also for 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 the whole for the whole industry there will be more and more qualified pilots so we are, uh, so this kind of problem I can I think. Around maybe maybe because uh, today the, uh, the the number of parity increase is is, fa is it's it's faster than the than the number of aircraft. So mm -hmm. I think this problem maybe can be solved by 2020. I guess. <laughs> Albert, what's the? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely problem. Uh, Indonesia Indonesia has um, recently built up uh, a lot of airport. Uh, uh, terminals in many cities, I think in more than 10 or 15 cities uh, throughout the Indonesia. But um, the main problem is that they only build a uh, terminal, not the runway. And in, in five biggest cities in Indonesia, I think four of them, uh, we don't have any slot anymore. So I think that is the main problem. And then they find it difficult to um, to acquire the land because of the uh, it is uh, it is a, a very uh, very difficult problem in, in Indonesia now how to to free a land uh, uh, to build um, so I think uh, all of the airline will adjust their capacity uh, accordingly because of that uh, it can be done in many ways some of them uh, shift to other region that uh, don't have the capacity pro uh, the uh, airport uh, slot constraint. Uh, some of them uh, 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 postpone some of the delivery. Uh, for existing over cap capacity, uh, some of the airlines also have moved uh, some of the aircraft uh, outside of the region. So eventually, I think um, uh, um, uh, it will sustain uh, uh, in a way in a, in a way um, that uh, on pilot issues, pilot issues is always a problem, always a problem. But I think uh, Indonesia is uh, open for foreign pilot, so it's not isolated, so it's not as severe as Thailand. I think. Uh, yeah. I think that's Please, yeah. I just want to, um, so for North Asia, uh, pilots are a huge issue for us. Um, I remember a conversation. Um, I had with Ito-san, who was, is the chairman of uh, ANA, when we were getting along with them, and we had a joint venture in Japan, and we were trying to find pilots, and he always said, yeah, you know, the senior pilots at ANA make more than I do. He's the CEO, right? And um, now, um, there are a huge outflow of pilots from Korea. I was just in Korea recently. They're going to China, because China's paying them more. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a successful, I mean, pilots will go where they're paid. Um, but for us, because um, the capacity has grown so quickly, but the time it takes to certify, especially captains, is a much slower process. Um, it's a huge issue for us. And when I look at um, Japan, we're setting up Japan. It used to be that our growth was determined by slots or how many airplanes you could get, or the discussions you had, you know, bilateral rights. Now that doesn't affect it at all. The only thing that affects our growth when we're trying to do our, our uh, network strategy, it's how many pilots can we get? How many captains can we get? 
So I think the only uh, solution we have in North Asia, we all have to establish, you know, first officer to captain upgrade programs. You got to get first officers in the pipeline. Um, but right now we have a huge shortage issue. I'm, yeah. So I was a little bit surprised to think that you think that hopefully by 2020, hopefully the supply will catch up with the demand for pilots. Because now in China there's a, a thousands, thousands of you know pilots uh, study to study outside China. I think the uh, and every year there's hundreds, hundreds coming back. So I think the uh, it starts it starts ten years ago when the when the CAC, when not only CAC but also all the airlines uh, recognized the uh, pilot shortage should be a big problem in the future. That's why almost all the airlines send lots of uh, just staffs to just go abroad. Or so I think now now after 10, 15 years, I think it's time for for I mean for harvest. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting because this pilot issue doesn't just affect airlines. It's also affecting regulators. So if we look at the downgrade um, from Cat 1 to Cat 2 for Indonesia and for Thailand, both of those downgrades were due to insufficient numbers of check captains within the regulator. So it, it, it's, it's an issue that, that, that affects not just the airlines but also the regulation, and therefore it's a sort of a double whammy for, for, for airlines. Um, so I think that's what we're really hearing here is that um, it, it's particularly difficult for countries that have already fairly restrictive policies towards the employment of captains and, and foreigners and what have you, like Japan and Thailand. But it's a problem across the board, and hopefully um, by 2020 <laughs> we'll get it sorted out. Um, since we've got AirAsia and, um, and, and Scoot here, one of the things that I really wanted to ask about was the long-haul, low-cost model. Um, because um, AirAsia X has uh, launched uh, effectively a, a sort of a long haul, low cost, and Scoot as well. And uh, what I wanted to ask really Campbell and, and, and Jim about was how, do, how, how successful is that model? Uh, what are the differences between the two? We've seen AirAsia X struggling a bit. Um, it looks as though Scoot's um, really had a sort of a dream, dream lift off since the 787 arrived last, I think it was February, wasn't it? Um, what are, you know, what, what's your experience with the, the long-haul low-cost, and what do you think the factors are that drive um, success or, or, or failure? So maybe, Jim, if we, if we start with you. Yeah, and, and Ben, uh, who's the CEO of AirAsia, could probably um, answer this question better than me. All right. Uh, but I'm, I mean, because I'm more on the short-haul side. Uh, but um, I, th I think the challenge for anybody who does long-haul um, uh, low-cost is even though your unit costs drop over time, I mean, over distance, mm. um, your RASC, your revenue per unit drops a lot faster. So the gap between your price that, and your, you know, the traditional carrier's price, um, your advantage shrinks. Mm. But as you're flying, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten hours, the fare difference when you have 29, you know, pitch seats and you don't have entertainment, um, it becomes a little bit more, you know, of a value proposition where customers are, are typically willing to pay. So I think the difference with long haul LCC, and I think we've been relatively successful uh, given that it's a tough market. I think you have to have a, a different offering. Mm. So it's not the same as a short haul. You got, you know, two hours, three hours max where you can do quick flights and you can just give them low price on time. I think the thing that you do have to solve is the balance between fare and some sort of product offering that makes the uh, flight kind of bearable. And I think that is something actually Scoot has done very, very well. Goodness, I'm not used to having nice words said about us from Malaysia. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, long haul low cost, I think, is it, the, your margins for error are very, very thin uh, for exactly the reasons Jim says. So I think really, if there's a secret to success, it's being disciplined and being focused. You, you, you need to be driven by the fundamentals of each route you fly rather than any particular, for example, ego desire to put a flag in certain cities. Um, so yes, our choice of 787 and the efficiency that accords has been helpful, but we've been building towards our current profitability for quite some time. Uh, choosing routes that we can dominate so secondary markets in China uh, where there is 
high elasticity of demand, our airfare can stimulate significant volume and therefore we can enjoy the advantages of a high capacity, low unit cost aircraft um, ha have been quite crucial. Um, tapping new markets that uh, are not well served by other carriers, for example, uh, doing uh, Japan via Taiwan or, or, or Japan via Bangkok, it means that we can offer a credible proposition to the Singapore or Japanese customer instead of them choosing Cathay Pacific or Thai Airways or Malaysia Airlines and, and keep that business within the, the SIA group. Uh, we need to have a, a, an attractive product proposition. Uh, as, as Jim says, you know, people will tolerate things for four hours that they won't tolerate for eight. Yeah. And, and so choice of legroom, choice of amenities, streaming movies, in-flight Wi-Fi, choice of meals, these are things that you don't normally associate with LCCs, but there are things, there are things that uh, not only are valued by the customer, but also are an opportunity for us to earn more money. Yeah. Uh, so I think we have the, the burden, but also the, the benefit of uh, having people on board for a long time and, and uh, the opportunity to provide them more service. Yeah, very interesting. So it's really about providing the, the services that customers want and then effectively gaining more revenue from that as well.